Glory to Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Blessed Lord, who have caused all holy scriptures to be read for our learning, grant that we may wisely hear them, read them, mark them, learn them, and inwardly digest them, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast to the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. O heavenly King, comfort a spirit of truth, who are everywhere present and filling all things. O treasury of blessings and giver of life, come dwell within us and cleanse our souls, O gracious Lord. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy immortal one, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy immortal one, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy immortal one, have mercy on us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and never shall be, world without end. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same Spirit we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord Jesus, you were misunderstood by your own. Help us when we are misunderstood. Help us to understand you in the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us to approach you and meet you in all of Scripture as we approach Scripture in prayer and asking the Holy Spirit's guidance as we interpret this in the context of the holy apostolic tradition out of which it came and in, in and by the authority of the church that you founded. Lord, your family said he's out of his mind, and that is so true of often society today, if we follow you. Let us not seek approval from anyone whose approval will oppose yours. Help us rather to approach in serenity everything and the power of your grace and persevere in faithfulness to you and ever deepen our faithfulness to you, ever growing in faith, hope, and love, true charity, agape charity, and in prudence, temperance, fortitude, and justice. Amen. And so we're reading the Gospel of Mark, and I'm using the a revised standard version and uh, the uh, Ignatius Catholic Study Bible New Testament, Second Catholic Edition, RSV, which was published in 2010 by Ignatius Press, San Francisco. And this is uh, chapter 3, verse 21. Then he went home, that's Jesus, and the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. And when his friends heard it, they went out to seize him, for they said, he is beside himself. And the scribes, who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebul and by the prince of demons, he casts out demons. And he called them to him and he said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, it, that kingdom cannot stand. But if, a, but if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. 
but no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, but whoever blasphemes, whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. And the uh, commentary in uh, the uh, Ignatius Catholic Study Bible, in the footnotes. Beelzebul, a pagan god worshipped at Akron in uh, Philistia. See, Baal Zebub in 2 Kings 1, verses 2 through 16. The title probably means Prince Baal, Baal being master, Baal. The scribes use it as a disdainful title for Satan, the prince of demons. It was commonly held that weaker demons could be exercised by more powerful ones. The scribes wrongfully attribute Jesus' power to the sorcery of Satan, the most powerful demon of all. See Matthew 9, 34, 10, 25, and the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 548. By ascribing the power of Jesus to Satan, the scribes reveal their own collaboration with the devil's kingdom. Satan's house will fall because Christ will conquer him, not because his demons are weakened by divisions within their own ranks. See Hebrews 2, 14, 1 John 3, 8, and Matthew 12, 25 through 26. An eternal sin. The scribes utter blasphemy by attributing to Satan what is actually the work of the Holy Spirit. Their sin is not unforgivable in principle since no sin can place us beyond the reach of God's mercy. However, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is a form of rebellion that is particularly grievous because it blinds people to their own need for forgiveness. In this case, sins are unpardonable when they are not confessed with contrition. See the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1864. The sin against the Holy Spirit was prefigured in the Old Testament, when the Israelites fashioned the golden calf, Exodus 32, 1 through 6, instead of giving worship and thanks to the Lord for their deliverance, they honored as their true redeemer an idol of their own making, Exodus 32, 4. Uh, and also, the... There are, every sin, in a sense, is a sin against the Holy Spirit, against the uh, reality of grace, the healing of grace flowing from the Holy Spirit, and indeed the very divine energies of God that he shares with us, you know, calling us to be, as Second Peter, uh, the first chapter says, partakers of the divine nature. So, final impenitence in grave, known, willed sin is the sin against the Holy Spirit. Because that's the total rejection of, of, of grace. That's, that's the expulsion of grace and setting up uh, an idol that will consume uh, in one's life, a, a, a grave sin. So uh, if someone says, oh, I've committed the sin against the Holy Spirit, I say, are you still alive? And usually they'll say yes. And I say, well, you can repent. As long as you have breath in you, you can repent. No matter how grave the sin is, you can repent. And you can seek uh, the mercy of God. Of course, you, you're still responsible for your actions. We always will be. But uh, that's part of the freedom. That's part of being godlike. And that being created in, in the divine image. Uh, in spirit. So uh, that's the reality of the sin against the Holy Spirit.
So people should never despair about being uh, being unable to be forgiven, whatever, uh, no matter how horrible the sin is. Uh, but again, of course, we don't follow the line of, of uh, easy believism, and which you say all you have to do is believe. You don't have to really. And some would say, oh, you only have to repent once, and then to all the grave sins afterwards, you don't have to repent of them because they're all covered by the the initial repentance. And some would even say, oh, it's it's you're just uh, there, there is no free will in this. You just are. Uh, caught up by God, either in, by grace or God refuses to catch you up in grace and cast you down. And it is nothing you can do about it. Uh, both of those things are not only wrong, but uh, the former one especially can, is, can be very dangerous spiritually and morally. Because it's a, you know, cause then you have a, a blank check to be as wicked as you want to. And then you think, oh, I can enter heaven. Well, of course, you cannot enter heaven. Even the slightest sin cannot be in heaven. It has to be yielded, it has to be repented of, it has to be uh, given up to God. We have to uh, uh, throw ourselves upon the divine mercy in everything. You cannot buy your way into heaven anyway, uh, not only by money, but by uh, so-called good deeds, if they're not really uh, flowing out of faith, hope, and love. So that... But of course, if you refuse to do, if, if you refuse to repent of grave sin, that's absolutely crucial to uh, the the working of justification. So for a conscious person, that is, because we're not talking about infants and stuff, who are not capable of grave sin anyway. So let's look at the commentary of, of uh, from the Catholic Commentary on Sacred Scripture, the Gospel of Mark by Dr. Mary Healy, which was published by Baker Academic, a division of Baker Publishing Group, Grand Rapids, Michigan, in 2008. 2008. And, and, and uh, Dr. Healy is also one of the co-editors of the whole Catholic Commentary. And this is page... 75, if you have that. I might push this a little further back. Put this up like that. There. Give me a little more room here with the, the books. And he had come home again and the crowd gathered, making it impossible for them even to eat. When his relatives heard of this, they set out to seize him, for they said, he is out of his mind. And I think that's the new American translation there. And uh, while we're at it, why don't we look at the gospel parallels and see if there's one of those in here. Hey, there's a house divided. Yes. And that was, and Matthew, knowing their thoughts, he said to them, and then in Mark, we just heard, and he called them to him and said to them in parables, because there's a broader sense of a parable. And then in Luke, Luke uh, 11, 17 to 23, but he, knowing their thoughts, said to them. And then they all have, uh, well, Matthew and Luke both say, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and the house falls upon house. Uh, that's Luke, actually. But uh, every, in Matthew, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And Luke also has, and in, in, in Matthew goes on, if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself, and then how will his kingdom stand? And Luke, and if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? And uh, the Mark one, I think, is more, which is, they're probably based on, the uh, other two synoptics, uh, Matthew and Luke. Um, if a kingdom, how can Satan sta cast out Satan? We ca Satan wouldn't. But of course, as we mentioned in the commentary, earlier commentary, uh, 
they thought well, pow more powerful demons could cast out lesser demons, especially if the lesser demons were uh, seemed a little too uppity and not uh, uh, totally enslaved to the higher demons, which would go on in a uh, infernal hierarchy of, or shall we say, someone once called it lowerarchy, um, <coughs> uh, because it's the opposite of sacred. From Yerus, it's the opposite of priestly. Um, <coughs> if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And that's one of the things of the collapse of the kingdom. But even more so, far more importantly, is that it can't stand, no matter how united it could be in its uh, rebellion against God, against the uh, almighty power of God. And in particular, the application of it with God plunging into our mess, God, the eternal word, taking out the fullness of our human nature, our materiality on himself, and that a man like us in all things but sin can't stand against that. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. So a house here, a bet, Beth, doesn't just mean a building, because if a building is, if this, no, sure, so if it's all, it's going to collapse. But also families uh, in that, if they're uh, all set against each other, it's going to, remember while I was giving platelets, there was a film on uh, the Ptolemies of Egypt, who talk about dysfunctional families, murderously dysfunctional families. Um, if that is, it, but, and, and they, more than anybody else, contributed to their own collapse. <clears throat> because of their being divided. If a kingdom is divided against itself, a kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. We'll put that aside then. And let's see if there are any questions from the uh, Ignatius Catholic Study Bible uh, questions for this section of Mark 3. Why did Jesus, well, this is from, you know, 2021. Why did Jesus' relatives think he was beside himself, quote unquote? Have you ever been criticized for being too religious? Or have you yourselves criticized others for that? Or being too prophetic, pointing to uh, being too, uh, quote unquote, rigid in pointing to objective morality or too concerned about, quote unquote, irrelevant people, anything from the uh, pre-born to the terminally ill? So like that. So um, if either is the case, what do you think is the problem? So these are for you to ponder over. And who is the strong man in verse 27? If a strong man has gained foothold in some area of your life, how can you bind him? Again, that's a, 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 a bad habit, a uh, influence, exterior influence, a uh, uh, evil influence, which can even be subtle uh, in that. In that, But then uh, its end is to uh, pull you away from God or to get you at least to quote unquote tolerate things like murderous evils, like abortion, etc., and things like that. How can you bind him? Only by the power of the Holy Spirit, only by the action of Jesus Christ. If you want to be a kinsman of Jesus, what will it take for you to be accepted as one? If you want to be in the family, you have to show the family traits of virtue and all that. So back to uh, Dr. Healy in the Gospel of Mark, there, her commentary. On page, again, on page 75. One of Mark's signature techniques is to 
sandwich one story inside another, so that each sheds light on the other. In this case, he arranges the three scenes in verses 20 to 35 into one block of material. In the first and third units, Jesus is misunderstood by his own family. The second, verses 22 through 30, involves a far se more serious charge <coughs> excuse me, from the religious authorities. After the appointment of the twelve, Jesus comes home to the house of Peter and Andrew in Capernaum. That seems to be this base there. He was it, 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 Once he was basically expelled from Nazareth, we don't hear him going back there for the most part. And so Capernaum there in the Sea of Galilee seems to be his center. And the, the house of, of uh, Peter and Andrew and Peter's mother-in-law there. That had been his home base. See uh, chapter 1, verse 29, and chapter 2, verse 1 of Mark. This time, the press of people is so great that Jesus and his disciples find it impossible to care for their own needs. So I've been to the house uh, there, oh, the, the, uh, what is uh, assumed to be the house from, from the archaeological evidence there, and the spaceship church that was built over it. But uh, what is it? So you can get access, direct access from the outside to the under, under the house. You can see it uh, there. And it wasn't that big by our standards. And we don't know how many people lived in there. You know, it's Peter, Andrew, maybe Peter's, and of course the, Peter's mother-in-law, which assumed in the Peter's wife, unless Peter's widow, the children, if they have children, Andrew, Andrew's wife, his children, stuff like that, others, uh, uh, probably uh, Peter's mother-in-law's husband is assumedly dead because he's not mentioned uh, in this, so... So it's so great they can't even eat. They could, so, uh, but if you're like me about deter being determined to eat, you'd certainly find a way. But uh, so this happens again in chapter six thirty one and chapter eight one of Mark. This time the people press so great that Jesus and his disciples find it impossible to eat. It's just you need to get it up into your mouth, pass the food down on the crowd, and can't even do that. It's so crammed in. Luckily, there wasn't a fire. Um, to understand the reaction of Jesus' relatives, it is important to recognize what family bonds meant in the social context of the time. The whole thing of the goel and the the, uh, the responsible person, the most responsible person in the clan of that, which is, and there was. Uh, and of course, Jesus here is scandalizing people by doing all sorts of things and making all sorts of claims. So they say he's out of his mind. So they're coming to stop this embarrassment and take him away. They set out to seize him, for they said he is out of his mind. He's taken leave of his senses. For the ancient Jews, as for many non-Western cultures today, an individual existed only as part of an extended family unit, and then also the extended social and all those things, which is why they have, uh, in this cycle of vendetta, if they, I can't get the perpetrator, we'll go after the relatives or people uh, associated with them, even if the association is, you know, of this particular group, so... Uh, go after another person, which is uh, in itself criminal for uh, a natural law. But you can see the, how the deeply these family bonds, social bonds, and other bonds, religious bonds and stuff uh, take, or uh, the, society, the sociology of religious bonds, we should say. As individuals existed only as part of an extended family unit whose authority, structure, Obligations and customs governed every aspect of life. Uh, so these people who said, you know, I just have a Jesus and me relationship, but I, it has nothing to do with anybody else. That's just alien, utterly alien to, to a Jesus' time and place. And ultimately, uh, yes, you have to have a deeply personal relationship with Christ and cultivate that even on, even on the private levels. 
But there's the corporate level. It's the church that we're said to, it's not uh, just a, a privatized relationship. The, in the body of Christ, there's no such thing as a truly privatized relationship. We're all co-responsible for each other. Including people on the other side of the world. But according to our get abilities, our opportunities, our means, and the like. As well as spiritual things, the charisms given to, as well as the material and intellectual and other things that we have. And our own social connections to help other people. <coughs> Any action of an individual with a reflection on the whole family. So we still have that in many ways. So your, maybe your mother said to you, remember you represent us when you go out. So, um, so any breach of family honor, and they had this whole often, uh, let's face it, twisted sense of family honor, but and, and it's still, but the, so if someone uh, dishonors or, or even shames, and even if the person's really innocent, uh, often uh, the family members were expected to kill the other person, the family member, or at least discipline the person severely somehow or other. If he, he or she brought shame onto the, uh, the family. Any breach of family honor would be met with severe discipline. Since Jesus' foster father Joseph was presumably no longer alive, see chapter 3, verse 31, Jesus' uncles and senior cousins would have considered him under their charge and answerable to them for his conduct. So hearing of all the commotion surrounding him, these relatives felt duty-bound to set out probably from his native village of Nazareth, which actually technically is not his native village, that would be Bethlehem, uh, but uh, the relatives on both sides, <coughs> Mary and Joseph's sides, uh, uh, 20 miles away, you know, if, if Joseph's relatives were there and not in Bethlehem or whatever, to seize him. The same verb used, used later for his arrest, in 1446. From their perspective, Jesus ought to be brought back home making tables and chairs, or probably working in stone more than in wood, uh, instead of attracting throngs of sick and demon-possessed people, not to mention arousing the hostility of the religious leaders. <coughs> their action was probably motivated in part by a desire to protect him. For they said, is a better translation, is better translated, for people were saying, on dit, as they say in French, for people were saying, and again in the RSV, since the subject is left vague, word was getting around that Jesus was out of his mind or beside himself in the RSV or, or totally crazed, meaning that his wonder-working activity seemed evidence of mental imbalance and his teachings, especially those that would <coughs> for Jesus Messiah, or even more scandalous, pointing to him as God. Since mental illness was often associated with demonic influence, and even physical illnesses like uh, epilepsy and things like that, see John tw 10, 20, these suspicions were soon to be seen as a lesser version of the charge leveled by the scribes in the next episode. <coughs> Page 76 the reflection and application. Based on their reaction, it appears that Jesus' relatives do not see anything in him other than the ordinary young kinsman they had known all their lives. The whole town of Nazareth will later display a similar response in chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. As the Gospel of John notes, even his brothers did not believe in him. John 7, 5, RSV, the brethren, the family members, the uh, close associates the brethren, not the children of Mary. The Son of God suffered misunderstanding even from those closest to him, his family, and on a wider scale, his people. <coughs> John one eleven, that the, 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 the people in his social circle, the, uh, the ever-expanding uh, familial and... Uh, Subfamilial connections that they have. 
of patronage and whatever they would be there. So too, his followers often experience the pain of misunderstanding or even mockery from family members who do not understand a life of radical commitment to Jesus. In contemporary secular culture, faithfulness to the gospel sometimes entails being willing to appear to the world as fools for Christ. Uh, someone would said to <coughs> someone I knew, uh, "What kind of a fool are you?" And this person's radical commitment to the gospel and to the faith, and he said, "Well, I'm a fool for Christ." For whom are you a fool? Yourself? Uh, people in, in social positions? People of, people of positions of influence? <coughs> running your life? Dictating to you all this fashion or whatever? And fashion tends to be. If you look, look at from uh, uh, stepping back and look at it tends to be high fashion. It tends to be absurd and often unhealthy. Um, <clears throat> so then he's accused of diabolic connivance. Well, let's see what the the Navarre Bible has to say about this section. Navarre Bible. Navarre. See, Navarre in, in Iberia and Navarre among the pirates, especially old Driscoll pirates. Uh, arr, arr. And this is, oh, in the VAR Bible, I should give its thing. Four Courts Press, Dublin, and Scepter Publishers, New York. Uh, 2008, and this is the 2013 reprint. And it's page... 172, if you have the book. The gospel will go on to introduce other groups of people, the 12, scribes, Pharisees, relatives of Jesus. And 20 to 21, some of his relatives regarded Jesus' commitment to his ministry as excessive, to put it mildly. This is also mentioned elsewhere. See Mark 6, 3. And it is reminiscent of the kind of reaction that the prophets encountered. See Jeremiah twelve six. Oh, that, uh, and the embarrassment to the family. Even Jeremiah, his own relatives, planning to kill him because he was such a an embarrassment. Uh, by the in the, the uh, by the standards of the world with the capital W. Reading these verses of the gospel, we cannot but be in awe of the efforts Jesus went to out of love for us. Many saints, followers of Christ's example, have been taken for madmen, but theirs was the madness of love for Jesus Christ. They always think of the, the Beatles song, The Fool on the Hill. So, but he knows that they're the fools in the end. He, he was meditating or whatever like that uh, and that and... Uh, Detached from the, the ways of sin and, and the like. The assessment that Jesus' relatives make of him pales in comparison with those accusations by scribes arrived from Jerusalem. They realize that Jesus has power over demons, but instead of attributing that power to God, and, and instead of, of looking at it, they, they're hunting for uh, often bizarre things like that. You see this you know, in attacks against Catholicism, Christianity in general, but, or, or uh, the good that's really done by people. Uh, they will always be suspicious of the motives. As Mother Teresa said, and who suffered greatly from this, for her service of the the poorest of the poor. Sometimes it's it's issued out of envy. Other times it's issued out of fanaticism. Because they said, oh, people in group X that can never do anything good, a uh, group that I'm not in. So this is, and of course, uh, Catholics are often in that, uh, 
a book of boogeymen of uh, many groups from, you know, radical fundamentalists to radical secularists. So it's interesting that the, the legalists and the hedonists get together against Jesus, the Pharisees and the, uh, some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians get together because they have a common foe in, in uh, Jesus. He's a common threat to them in this. And so this is still so today. Jesus makes a series of comparisons, verses 23 to 27, to show that their accusation makes no sense. His coming into the world has provoked a conflict between two kingdoms, that of Satan and that of God. Therefore, if Jesus has overcome Satan, see chapter 1 of Mark 24 through 27, it is impossible that Jesus should be one of his party, Verses 24 and 26 here. Satan is powerful, but Jesus is more powerful. Indeed, as God incarnate, most powerful. At the end of the passage, this is page 174. At the end of the passage, Jesus who has shown his compassion by forgiving sinners and sharing meals with them, points out how difficult it is for people to obtain forgiveness if they close their mind to the truth. That culpable blindness explains the gravity of the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Attributing to Satan good actions worked by God himself. Anyone who does such a thing is like a sick person who is so distrustful that he rejects the doctor and the medicine that would work his cure. That is why our Lord says that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will never find forgiveness. Not because God cannot forgive every sort of sin, but because the person in question is so blind that he does not appreciate and rejects the graces of the Holy Spirit. See the note on Matthew 12, 22 to 27. And let's look at, I think it's Father Gerald Sloyan, Dr. Sloyan anyway, who, uh, eternal rest if he's uh, deceased now, which may well be since this is 1960. It's from the New Testament Reading Guide, The Gospel of St. Mark by Gerard S. Sloyan, from the Collegeville uh, commentary, the commentary, the uh, New Testament reading guide, by, uh, which not only has Benedictines involved, but others involved in there, uh, uh, other scholar, Catholic scholars from the time. And uh, Gerard Sloan was from the Catholic University of America in Washington. And it's published by Liturgical Press, or was published. I don't know if you can still get it in print. Uh, Collegeville, Minnesota. They put, there was another one put uh, that, that was put uh, together in one book, which came out later, I think in the, the 80s or 90s. So, which I had, but I gave it to someone, a student at the time. So, uh, so this is uh, page 34, 34. Fears of the family of Jesus, Mark 3, verses 20 through 21. This brief section is a striking proof of the authentic character of Mark's narrative, as are so many of his quote, quote, unquote, primitive touches. Matthew and Luke omit many of them, presumably to save themselves the task of explaining the meaning. Crowds are around the house, Peter's, to which the small company has come back. They are so numerous that they, the disciples, cannot eat bread. Word of this popular success reaches hoi par autu, which is uh, those about the self, as you could say, 
which may bear the meaning of neighbors or followers or uh, surrounding people, but here almost certainly means family members. They contemplate seizing him, a bold move, because it is being said that he has gone mad. It is doubtful that they are trying to make take him take nourishment, you know, since he can't eat. Yeah, uh, very traditional in Jewish culture, as in many Mediterranean cultures, to uh, encourage eating, or even Chinese. I think I'm told in Ch uh, Mandarin, as it could be Cantonese, that uh, uh, how, are, how are you is, have you eaten? So um, that's what I'm told. I don't know myself if that's the case. So they contemplate seizing him. It is doubtful that they're trying to make him take nourishment. They act protectively, or it may be the normal way of those who claim kinship with a public figure, especially an embarrassing public figure. This family group seems to share the popular view of Jesus' state of religious exaltation. If there is any real sympathy between his purposes and their outlook, we do not find it in Mark. So they're going to take him off uh, to cease this embarrassment of uh, his making these bizarre claims of being God, even in the this end of being Messiah, which he doesn't do outright because we've talked about the messianic secret here in Mark. The blasphemy of the scribes, chapter three, verses 22 to 27. Unfriendly witnesses from Jerusalem are introduced into the narrative for the first time. Men learned in the law observe him and pass a quick judgment. His power is satanic. He is in collusion with Beelzebul, as all the Greek manuscripts call him, the Lord of the Flies, the Lord of Dung, the God of <coughs> Acharon, Akron, the Philistine, or Lord of the Dwelling, <coughs> Oikos is dwelling, the house, Oiko Despotain, the uh, master there. A despot, our word despot sort of comes from that, but it doesn't mean the same thing. Espona uh, despota, they would say to uh, a bishop, you know, to uh, uh, wishing him many years and anything. But um, uh, it doesn't mean he's a despot, of course, bishops should never be despots, but I'm not going to go there right now. So um, whoever, whichever the correct Hebrew derivative an uncomplimentary name for the devil going back to Canaanite days is meant. Jesus assembles them for this purpose, response. His answer is couched in the first figurative or gnomic speech of Mark's account. The parable in Hebrew, mashal, comparison, which he utters describes the dissolution that overtakes a kingdom torn by eternal, internal strife. And a second figure, <coughs> excuse me, which follows closely, Semitic style. He speaks of the same fate in terms of a divided household. Satan, observe that Jesus here does not use popular terminology, could look for his own finish if he were fool enough to send Jesus out in his employ. The second end with a brief story of the robber who must first trust the household to tie him up, if his foray is to be successful. Satan is the mighty, the strong, who must be restrained in the last age. See Isaiah 24, 22. The clear implication is that Jesus has come to plunder and despoil the ancient enemy. In no sense can he be called his ally. The goods, of verse 27 are probably not to be assigned any allegorical meaning. Declaration on blasphemy and unforgiven sin. Chapter three, verses 28 to 30. The familiar, amen, amen, which would be truly, sometimes I solemnly assure you, uh, verily, all that stuff. 
truly. The, and when he says amen, amen, when he says amen, he wants you to really pay attention. Amen, amen, really, really pay attention. Amen, I say to you, <coughs> occurs here for the first of 13 times in Mark. A solemn affirmation always follows it. In this case, it has been conjectured that since rhetorically the seeming antithesis lacks point. Jesus was actually contrasting the crude and blasphemous speech addressed to men, sons of men, which that directed toward, with that directed towards the Holy Spirit. It is called an everlasting sin, presumably because hurling ugly epithets at God or confusing the all-holy with evil argues to a particularly conscious malice. Jesus himself thinks of himself in this hidden guise as son of man, as one who can endure such obloquy, obloquy, a ball, such uh, insult, shall we say, obloquy, <coughs> and uh, malicious uh, condemnation, compared with the spirit of God. This is the meaning of Matthew twelve thirty two, Pure evil would be required to account for an attack on the spirit. What Mark actually says, however, is that the sole exception to the general law of forgiveness is the case of looking upon the works of light and attributing to darkness and, and not pulling back from that. <clears throat> no, and knowing, knowing this, that the, mal this, the malice is, as was mentioned, particularly conscious malice uh, is involved. And unto the end, until the last breath. The Lord of mercy does not here retract his mercy. He merely names that condition whereby men would seal themselves off from it. And let's go back to... Let's go back to Dr. Healy. Diabolical Accusations. This is page 76. By the scribes who had come from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebul. By the prince of demons, he drives out demons. Summoning them, he began to speak to them in parables. About this, how can Satan drive out Satan? The king divided against itself. If Satan rises against himself and is divided. How he cannot stand. That's the end of him. And then the <clears throat> the little story, the little parable about the strong man's house uh, and if it's going to be plundered, the guy has to be restrained. So, And then also look up the... And then they say to you, all sins and all blasphemies that people utter will be forgiven them. <clears throat> but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an everlasting sin. For this, they said, he has an unclean spirit. For they had said that. Inserted in the middle of the account of family misunderstanding is this episode involving a far more sinister accusation. For the first time in the gospel, scribes from Jerusalem appear, big guns perhaps sent by the authorities in the capital to check out the rumors concerning the miracle worker from Nazareth. The Jerusalem scribes were experts in the Mosaic law, whose authority was more weighty than that of the Galilean Pharisees, and who emerge as Jesus' fiercest opponents in the gospel. Mark 7, 1, <clears throat> 7, 5, 10, 33, 11, 18, 27, <clears throat> and 14, 1. Bingo, no. Uh, their verdict is categorical. He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he drives out demons. See John 10.20 for a similar accusation. Beelzebul is a name for Satan, probably derived from the title of the false god of the Canaanites, Baal the Prince. <coughs> Baal Zebul. Beelzebub. But anyway, Lord of the Flies, Lord of Dung, stuff like that, Master of Dung. For uh, readers of the gospel who are privy to Jesus' divine identity and have followed his ministry of healing and liberation of the oppressed, such a charge is chilling. 
Instead of taking umbrage, Jesus responds with patience and serenity, using parables or analogies to refute the allegations step by step. His summoning of the scribes suggests that they were spreading the rumors behind his back, which is always worse. <coughs> because it, it mutates, and it's an act of cowardice as well as an act of malice. But he wishes to confront them face to face. He answers the twofold charge that he is possessed by Satan and that he performs exorcisms by demonic sorcery in reverse order. First, the claim that Jesus is using demonic power to cast out demons is disproved by its logical absurdity. How can Satan drive out Satan? And why would he want to? In three parallel statements, Jesus likens Satan to the ruler of a kingdom or house who would naturally act in self-interest. What ruler would instigate a revolt against his own rule? Everyone knows that civil war in a kingdom or internal strife in a household spells destruction. If Satan were making war in his own subordinates, through Jesus' exorcism, Satan's dominion would have quickly collapsed. Some ancient manuscripts of Mark read Beelzebub, I had mentioned that before. See the New Jerusalem version, which is close to the mocking distortion of Baal's name, Baal Zebub, Lord of the Flies, in 2 Kings 1 3 6. <coughs> Jesus' listeners might have perceived in 3, 24 and 25, an allusion to Herod the Great, whose household and kingdom were both divided after his death in 4 BC and came to an end in the end. So that, uh, I, never, I wondered why they never made a mini-series on the house of Herod, because they were so, to put it mildly, dysfunctional. And... Uh, the wages of sin is death. They should see that. And again, I mentioned the Ptolemies before. That was similar, probably worse. Um, going on. So Jesus uses a burglary analogy, this time to explain what he's doing, what he actually is doing. Satan is compared to a strong man self-assuredly guarding his possessions. In this case, uh, stolen possessions, <coughs> not his real possessions, that is, possessed human beings in particular. Because Jesus, uh, as exorcist, is much appealed to. By referring to demon possessed people as Satan's property, Jesus suggests that the evil one has obtained a real, though illicit, foothold in their souls. No one can release them from such captivity except by first tying up the strong man. Only then can he plunder his house. Jesus has broken into the domain of evil, incapacitating its ruler so that he can despoil his possessions. This analogy evokes a prophecy of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, can booty be taken from a warrior or captives be rescued from a tyrant? Yes, captives can be taken from a warrior and booty be rescued from a tyrant. Those who oppose you, I will oppose and your sons I will save. Isaiah 49, 24 to 25. <clears throat> As John the Baptist had announced, Jesus is the mightier one, who alone has power to bind Satan and release those suffering under his tyrannical rule. Finally, Jesus addresses the scribe's first charge, that he is possessed by Beelzebul. Not with a parable, but with a somber warning. Amen means truly, or so be it in Hebrew, and is used at the end of prayers to express agreement. See Nehemiah 8.6. Jesus' custom of saying amen, amen, to, pre to preface, and that's italicized, a solemn affirmation is a completely new usage. Its closest parallel is the divine oath. As I live, says the Lord, often used to introduce God's most solemn warning. Again, this isn't going to uh, put him in good favor with the, the, uh, the zealous uh, legalists and uh, others because uh, who are always on a hunt for blasphemy, except for their own, of course, people uh, doing that. So um, 
Uh, but you don't have to hunt for blasphemy nowadays. We just had this thing of the the drag queen uh, anti-Catholic group, the so-called Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. And what they do is, I can't even mention it on on the air, online or anything like that. But they're praised and awarded by the Dodgers in Los Angeles. How how degenerated uh, we are and stuff like that. Well, of course, anti-Catholicism has always been a foundational bigotry of Anglo-America. And you might say, well, the, the 17th century, uh, maybe you had a bit of a foundation with their, their dealings with Spain and then later with France and stuff like that. But of course, they were just as bigoted and, uh, and ruthless and, let's face it, murderous. It's the worst thing that, that really chairs the heart of Satan, of uh, murders of uh, ones done in the name of God, especially the name of Jesus. That's because he uh, will kill a number of birds with one stone with that. Um, see Numbers 14, 28, Isaiah 49, 18, and Ezekiel 5, 11, for as I live, says the Lord. Thing. Introdu- God's introduction to Solomon waters. But here, Jesus is, is again insinuating that he's God by such things. Here the affirmation is first and foremost that all sins are forgivable, even all blasphemies, which are the most serious since they are committed against God himself. To blaspheme is to insult or abuse the name of God. However, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never have forgiveness. What does it mean to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit? In the context of this passage, it is to harden one's heart so completely that one defiantly refuses to recognize the action of God and even attributes to evil the good works done by Jesus in the power of the Spirit and persevering in that to your last breath. See Mark 1.10 and Isaiah 5.20. It is therefore to close the door to the Holy Spirit's inner work of conversion. The point is not that there are any exceptions to God's mercy. Rather, the point is that persons who persist in such willful blindness refuse to repent and thus choose to close themselves to the forgiveness that God offers through Jesus. No willful blindness in this. Mark explicitly connects this blasphemy With the scri- against the Holy Spirit with the scribes' accusation. Jesus is not declaring that the scribes have committed the everlasting sin, but is warning them of the grave peril they are in unless they open their hearts to the Spirit and repent. And uh, the comment there in the uh, gray uh, rectangle there, uh, living tradition uh, commentary there, there. In his encyclical on the Holy Spirit, Pope John Paul II explained that the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, quote, does not properly consist in offending against the Holy Spirit in words. It consists rather in the refusal to accept the salvation which God offers to man through the Holy Spirit, working through the power of the cross, unquote. It is, quote, the sin committed by the person who claims to have a right to persist in evil in any sin at all, and who thus rejects redemption. The Catechism adds, quote, there are limits to the mercy of God. There are, excuse me, there are no limits to the mercy of God, which is infinite, as he is. But anyone who deliberately refuses to accept his mercy by repenting, rejects the forgiveness of his sins and the salvation offered by the Holy Spirit. Such hardness of heart can lead to final impenitence and eternal loss. Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1864. And uh, Pope Paul, uh, John Paul's uh, encyclical of the Holy Spirit was Lord and giver of life. Dominum et vivificatem. It's in the accusative, yes, I know, because that these encyclicals are named from the first words in it. And of course, Latin word order, you don't have to, you don't need the special order, word order that you would have in English because it's a cased language. So you know this is the object of either a preposition or a, a verb 
when you just see the endings on it, the accusative endings on it, on these words. Okay, so we have that, and we've done that. So let's look at the, again, at the gospel parallels about uh, ev the evil here. Okay. And uh, this, if you uh, are using the uh, gospel parallels, these gospel parallels of Thomas Nelson, Nashville, Camden, and New York. If you hear Nashville, I feel that it should have a a good uh, guitar accompaniment. To the, so this was um, the uh, uh, first published in 1949. And I'm using the seventh printing from 1973 when I got it. Actually, I got it in 1974 at the seminary there when I was in room 321 in St. John's, which I don't think is there anymore, but because they expanded the rooms to make the little sort of little suites for the seminarians there. Wow. So this... Accusations against Jesus. This is page uh, 61, if you have that. And there are other other gospel parallel sort of things that are around uh, uh, that put the, uh, the different parts of the gospels together. If, they, if, they, you know, if it's allegedly from Q, from uh, what they have together or what they don't, you know, uh, for the synoptics in particular, but sometimes John gets in there too. So, so the, the, he has the parallel for here, the, uh, Mark 3, 19 to 22, uh, Matthew 12, 22, 24, and uh, it goes on. When a blind and dumb demoniac was brought to him, that someone possessed by a demon, and he healed him so that the dumb man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed. And they said, can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. And in Luke, now he was casting out a demon. This is Luke eleven fourteen through 16. Now, and this is revised standard. Now, he was casting out a demon that was dumb, that meant mute. When the demon was gone out, the, mute, the dumb man, the mute man, spoke out and the people marveled. But some of them, so it doesn't mention the Pharisees or, or the scribes. See, uh, uh, Mark has the scribes from Jerusalem and uh, Matthew just mentions the Pharisees. Heard, because you always have, when you say this, it's not it's a general thing, it's some people in this, these groups, um, uh, because we have to avoid what they're doing, which is the generalization of demonization. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, while others, to test him, sought from him a sign from heaven. I and mean, that's what they have in, in Mark. It says they want a sign from him, but a miracle, another miracle. But often when they get a miracle, they say, oh, not that one. We want this miracle. So uh, multiplication of the loaves, well, that's good. No, we want uh, the miracle of uh, Moses that God gave for Moses, the uh, bread coming out of the sky, the bread from heaven. And then Jesus uses that for an I-N statement when most I-N statements are, I'm God, but you have to, put the puzzles together. Because if Jesus started out saying, I'm God, initially, he would never have gotten to the Sermon on the Mount. He would never have gotten anywhere. He would have been stoned to death right away. And even claiming to be the Christ. So he uses this third person thing, the son of man, from the son of man from Ezekiel, not the, I mean, if not from Ezekiel, from, um, uh, Daniel. 
from Daniel. There it is. Right, which is different. Son of man from Ezekiel is like a mortal. You're a mortal person. And uh, the son of man from Daniel is heavenly, heavenly sent from uh, the ancient of days. Uh, so, uh, uh, and he always says the son of man. He doesn't say I'm the son of man either. So again, you have to connect the dots. But they don't totally connect until he wants to. At the end, at the end, when he says you'll see the son of man coming out of the sky, and then they'll say, but for the meat have we of of, of uh, witnesses? He, he's, his blasphemy is so evident there. So that was, of course, a sin against the spirit. But is was it the sin against the spirit? The, we assume that these people, often Christians assume that these people were utterly insincere. But um, they were probably very good. So we have to save this, another false messiah here, bring a Roman disaster out, of course. The Roman disaster came anyway, but um, they had that. So, well, we should stop there. Stop there, and let me mark this. Uh, we know the true family of Jesus is coming up, which is the spiritual family, the family of grace. So let's pray the Our Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Someone gave me this card here from A to the Church in Need of... Mary pointing out Jesus there to uh, the people in need there. And one of those persons is, uh, seems to be Bishop Oscar Romero in this down there. So, or, or blessed Oscar Romero, is he saint now? And because Mary's about to put the mantle over that with the ancient tradition of being covered with the, the mantle with the protection of prayer. That's that. Nice colors. Okay. And I gave you the blessing, did I? Yes. Okay. Bye now. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. I'll give you another blessing. May God bless you, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Bye now. And who do we have? Amber Van Grant and Barbara Black Howdy. Aloha. <laughs>